Hi, everybody. Welcome to the next installment. I have no idea how many we've done. I'm doing this on this book, which is a rather concise book, not too many pages, because I realize that a lot of things are kind of packed into it. So commentary kind of elucidates. And then if you listen to commentary, then you can go back and you can see, like, when you read it, it is, uh, you, you get the sort of larger ramifications. This relates to the Buddhist traditional method of education, which involved like what they call a root text, sometimes like Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, or like Nagarjuna's centrist verses, wisdom, the centrist verses, root centrist verses. You have something you memorize, which is like just an aphorism, and very, very concise. And then you get commentary on that, and the commentary analyzes and goes back and forth and generates an inner debate in your own mind where you're going against your own predisposed idea or preconceived idea and presupposition, and you're looking critically, is that really well-founded, and what evidence is it based, who is the person who is assuring us of that, and so on. And then you find things like what we're assured of in our culture, that you're going to be nothing when you die, is idiotic and based on no evidence and is simply a dogma. And then you, that weakens its hold over you in your view, and you reluctantly come around to the view that what you do in this life has a higher degree of importance because you will carry the consequences beyond death into the future life. It isn't like some all-powerful authority will come and punish you or reward you. It isn't that. It's that the natural shaping of your life through evolutionary activity of body, speech, and mind will determine your next life. So then suddenly what you do has a much bigger kind of horizon of consequence, and it makes you want to be more careful and less reckless and more, more specific about what you do. So, so anyway, let's see how, what I'm, how I'm addressing this. Coming to a new understanding is the heading. As for how I personally try to combine realistic livelihood with Dharma practice and further study, although here I am kind of separating the two, practice and study, and this is part of a big misunderstanding about Buddhism, that practice is meditating, and meditating is not thinking about anything, is emptying your mind so that you have a peace of mind by not having any thought in it, and like as if that were a big goal. But that is a useful thing to be able to do to calm your thinking down and also to focus your thinking where you can think down one track very strongly, which you can better do when you can also do without thinking at all. So it's a good skill to develop one-pointedness, as it's called. But the main purposes of Buddhist inquiry and meditation and investigation of reality is rather analytical rather than just holding it in a the one point on one thing. Uh, it, it is rather seeing through illusions and or, and or seeing to illusions when you realize that what you thought was reality, what is illusion, is illusory, and then you see deeper and you understand what really is going on. And because the goal in Buddhism is realism, as I've said so many times, is knowing reality, because that's then when you become really open-minded in your view, because you realize that reality is beyond your ability to be sure of what it's going to be through some description, through some dogmas, through some formula, and therefore having to be more open-minded to observe more carefully, because there's always more to reality than what you can get from a single perspective. So that's why realism is the goal. That is what enlightenment is, is the ultimate realism, where you're seeing everything from every perspective actually simultaneously, which at first seems impossible to us because we're used to just have, having our own perspective. And, um, but actually, given infinite time, why couldn't we become a kind of cloud of knowing where we would surround the object of knowledge, we would merge with the object of knowledge, and we would know it from inside and outside, from up and down, from right and left, back and front. Okay. So here I'm wrongly saying practice and study, as if they were different. 
That's all I mean to say, and that's wrong. I'm just doing that out of the reflex of the way Buddhism and Buddha's educational teaching has been misinterpreted in the English language. So practice, practice of course, is not always study. It sometimes can be realization, meditation. It can be ethical action. It can be doing nothing sometimes. But, uh, and study is a specific type of thing. So there could be a way of, of separating it. But since most Buddhists will say practice means meditating with an empty mind, that's wrong. And I'm, I'm guilty of that. I made the university into my monastery, or rather I found my monastery in the university. I love teaching. And I would say that the teaching experience is a great way to learn, which is why I love it. Because when you come at something worrying and concerned as a teacher is about other people's perspectives on the thing you're talking about and you have a perspective on, then you see it from their different possible perspectives and you, and you, uh, you then learn more about it because you observe it more carefully because you see how they see it. And if you, the best way of doing it, of course, is a kind of seminar style where you mutually discuss. But even if you become a little bit empathetic as a lecturer, you sort of automatically sort of empathize on the audience's view. And therefore, you t tailor sort of subliminally, instinctively, intuitively, you tailor the way you say it to how they might be misperceiving it or how they might be perceiving it. When you have to explain something to someone who really wants to understand, you see yourself and your subject in a new light, and you can have new insights. And perhaps it is the process of your own mind coming to a new understanding, a deeper insight into some topic that inspires students to go through their own version of a process of understanding. I think that's absolutely true. I can't remember his name now, but the one teacher I had at college of literature, and I remember we did Faulkner, and we did D.H. Lawrence, and we did, um, I forget who else, but we did this, that level of people, <coughs> American writers mostly, I think, American and British writers. And uh, he did learn as he talked. In other words, he was thinking it anew, and he would come, oh, and he would have like, aha, you know. He would see something new in material he had taught many times. And it was that him coming to something new that enabled you to gain a kind of insight. I do remember that. So I would therefore go back to his class, a lot of them I didn't go back to. But in order to do that, the crucial thing as a teacher is never to pretend to understand something that you don't. The deadly temptation for a teacher is, when asked a question, even though you don't really know the answer, to decide to pretend that you do because the students expect it or because you feel you need to maintain your status as a teacher. That's a deadly. I think the key to better teaching is to be completely open with students and to remember that you are learning along with them. Oh, good. So I'm doing this. It's much more liberating that way because you are free to explore new angles or new perspectives, question your own what you've said, just said even, or to back down from certain lines of thought, saying, I was just thinking out loud, but that is not the way to get to the answer. You should say it like that. Aha. Very good. I like that. Worldwide struggles with the new heading. Worldwide struggles with realistic livelihood. In 1950, when the Chinese Communist Army invaded eastern Tibet, and by the way, they were very highly reluctant to do that. The Red Army, different, different battalions of them, regiments and so on, were very reluctant to stagger up into Tibet. Some of the old timers, had been on the long march through eastern Tibet, and they knew how difficult the altitude was and how the people were not Chinese and they were not necessarily intoxicated with delight at seeing the army marching through, who usually would rob their food and do things like that to them. So, so they were, so Mao, I think the third or fourth general that he insisted they go and invade Tibet upon getting independence in China. They, three of them refused, and finally one of them said, okay, I'll go, because he was already nearby. And, um, and that, that's usually not known. You know, they think they, they, they really didn't want it. They'd been fighting Chiang Kai-shek and before that the Japanese, 
and they really didn't want to go up there. The young Dalai Lama fled to the southern border, poised to go into exile in 1950. After some time, against the advice of his counselors, he decided to return to Lhasa and try to work with the Chinese conqueror to minimize the violence of both the occupier's oppression and his people's resistance. Because some of them were not listening to the Buddhist thing of nonviolence and the Dalai Lama's advice that while, whereas Buddhist, Buddhist nonviolence does allow self-defense resistance if you can get away with defending yourself. But if self-defense only means provoking your aggressor more forcefully to kill you harder or torture you more, then it's useless and stupid. And so Buddhist nonviolence is very practical. It isn't actually fanatical. But in the case of Tibet and China at that time, there was no way they could resist, really. So uh, he struggled to do so for eight long years, from 51 to 59, even going to Beijing in 1954 to negotiate with Mao and Zhou and Deng, and going to India in 1956 to implore Nehru to intervene diplomatically, and he even considered staying in India in 56, because he pretty much realized by then it was fairly hopeless and that the Chinese didn't want to get along with Tibet, they didn't want to honor their pledge made when they first invaded, not to interfere with Tibet's culture, but let Tibet gradually, you know, in the confidence that everybody would want to be a communist, which of course is misplaced, but they were pretended to have that, that they would therefore not by violence overtake Tibet's culture. They promised that at, in 1950 because they had to get in there and build roads and create supply lines and do this before they could confidently take Tibet. So they were really just fooling the Tibetans. Some of the Tibetans kind of knew that, but some were ever hopeful. So anyway, he went there. And then before realizing in 1958 that he could not, from within the country, stop either the violence of the Chinese genocide or the violent resistance of his people, his version of realistic livelihood could only include work to relieve his people's suffering by escaping into exile in 1959 to speak for them to the world and gradually bring international pressure to bear on China to relent in their oppression. His decisions were invariably both principled along nonviolent lines and pragmatic given his nation's relative extreme weakness in modern military terms, aiming to minimize the violence, whatever the difficulties and sacrifices required. Among so-called Buddhist countries, quote unquote, only some of the Indian nations, who subsequently disappeared, unfortunately, Tibet and Mongolia, went so far as to mainstream Buddhist sciences, spiritualities, and ethics in spite of thereby suffering military and political consequences. Because, of course, a truly Buddhist nation would not maintain an army. <clears throat> they would have principles of nonviolence, which, and they would only seek resolving conflict by dialogue and nonviolent, also for, forceful, but nonviolent resistance. And that was Mongol, that was these various countries in India in North and South India at different times, because India has always been dozens of countries, not just one. And um, when they became very strongly monasticized by the Buddhists and then developed universities that were teaching Buddhist principles, so that that was the major educational institution in that country. And then the kings themselves became major patrons of the Buddhist teachers and the, and the, and the educationalismo of the population. Uh, and then that would, they would become demilitarized, and then they would, be evolved, they would be victimized by a neighbor who wasn't that good, even within India. Or they would be swallowed under an empire that was militaristic and so on, like the Gupta Empire. So it wasn't, you know, those disappeared. Then it went to Tibet, which at the time initially was a conquest empire. And then in a few centuries, about 20 generations, they demilitarized and they lost the empire. And, they've, and, they've de and they fractured into regional entities for a while, then came back together on a Buddhist principle. And finally, in the 17th century, in Tibetan modernity, when they had their own modernity, they completely demilitarized, and they turned over 
responsibility for governance to monastics, to mendicants, sort of the opposite of what it had been in India, because they found the mendicants were more honest. They didn't have a, a, a dynastic or a family attachment to creating wealth for future generations. They, had, they were, had basically had vows of propertylessness, so you had a ruler who wasn't seeking to enrich themselves, etc. And in principle, I'm saying not, they weren't always perfect, but in principle. And, uh, and therefore became a uniquely Buddhist society and, had, and burgeoned in art and literature and philosophy and in numbers of people becoming truly true siddhas, truly adept attainers. And then they managed to spread that initially through diplomacy, but then they managed to spread that throughout Central Asia, and they gave the Mongolian Empire, which still existed at that, in those early centuries of the second millennium, second common era millennium, and actually the Mongolians, which was the biggest Eurasian empire ever, gradually adopted that same nonviolent thing and became regionalized and became not, no longer a menace to their neighbors and so on, and uh, showed that a nation, even an empire that was based on violence, the great Mongolian conquest empire from China to Vienna, uh, and they only didn't bother with Western Europe because it was relatively poor, and they didn't have very good food <laughs> and plumbing, and they had all of China and all of Persia and, 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 they were, and the Baghdad and all of that. They owned everything throughout Eurasia, more of the biggest empire of all, really. And that's how, why Russia is such a big country. In a way, they, they, they stepped into the interconnectedness that the, Mong that the Mongolians created with terrible violence, of course. But then they became peaceful, which is kind of a miracle. And it's very important to know historically, because in our Pentagon-obsessed country of the United States, uh, we are taught in history that everybody's got to have a big military and they've got to beat up their neighbors or be beaten up by them, that it's an inevitable law in spite of Socrates even arguing that's not the case, but they, we still are brainwashed like that. So we don't, we don't know of a history, we, we are not taught a history of countries that gave up their militarism and then flourished, in fact, and became a positive influence on the countries around them, which is now what the whole planet has to do if we're going to survive. We have to take that huge money that is invested in militarism in, this, in the world of mutual opposition with different parties across borders, with nuclear up to nuclear weapons and banned the submarines and all sorts of germ, chemical, horrible stuff. And we have to, everyone has to give up doing that, take that huge wealth and put it into restoring the rivers and the forests and the, and the fields and, the, and everything, you know, and the glaciers and so forth. Tremendous work we, that, that wealth can do if it's not tied up in the stupid glaring at each other across borders and occasionally having conflicts across borders. So, among so-called, yeah, so only Tibet, some of the Indian nations, Tibet and Mongolia, went so far as to main mainstream Buddhist science and spirituality and ethics, in spite of thereby suffering up to nowadays modern time, military and political consequences. However, we should still study their examples in looking at realistic livelihood choices facing us today on the national as well as the individual levels, since the 21st century situation is novel, perhaps unprecedented in recent millenniums, in the sense that the survival instinct causing you to militarize a nation is no, it was, it was you know, sort of half-baked survival enhancing in times of peace, but now is survival destroying because no winners in any such military conflicts. Everything just gets destroyed on both sides. The planetary situation, that's well argued actually by Westerners, it doesn't involve a Buddhist uh, argument exactly, but the Buddhist argument supports it strongly and shows that it's possible uh, and shows the educational methods required to make a population capable of, uh, of sacrificing that kind of uh, violent self-defense orientation and self-aggrandizement orientation. The planetary situation is that our environment, the irreplaceable basis of our lives, cannot sustain either industrial consumerism or industrial militarism 
with their horrific technological power. It seems clear enough now that being highly armed and poised for war is no longer survival enhancing. Yeah, good. I have a slogan I am fond of repeating, that the nations of our planet must now shift from mad to mud, mutual assured destruction to mutual unilateral disarmament, which I realize is a paradox, because unilateral means you're just willing to do it yourself on principle, but then the other one has to be willing to do that too. So mutual unilateral disarmament, acronym MUD, instead of MAD, which is mutual assured destruction, which is what we've been doing, which has also been good. The nuclear thing has avoided all-out non-nuclear war up until recently, and it will avoid that, I think, because when they lose in Ukraine and they have to retreat back to Russia, Muscovia will not use nuclear in spite of their threats. We should know that for sure. Mutual and unilateral are, of course, contradictory. Oh, I wrote that on the surface, but deeper down are both necessary and possible. This might be better understood by imagining two gamblers in a standoff where each has a gun cocked and wired somehow on the other's temple. If either pulls the trigger, the other's death convulsion will cause their trigger to, act, to squeeze their trigger so that there can be no winner of such a standoff. Each must then, while carefully observing the other, extricate the gun from the wiring as the other side does, and then carefully the two lower the guns while the other does it in the same timing, bit by bit, as they watch each other. <laughs> a little bit danger at that time if you've kind of let go your trigger finger. Then the other one can do it, you can think. It's a mutual unilateral, very tricky. Realistic livelihood today, therefore, must involve the choices of individual self-determination over collective conformity gentle self-risking over violent self-protection, intensive self-conquest through self-transformative super-education over other conquest and other domination through some kind of manipulative education, the many caring for everyone over each one being dragooned to serve an imagined collective interest determined by dictators in Star Trek terms the many for the one over the one for the many. <laughs> and clear tolerance of religious ideological pluralism and democratic egalitarianism over any form of intolerant orthodoxy and oligarchy. Now under the heading of the transcendent virtues. So what does developing a realistic livelihood mean in practical terms? Let's go beyond the tenfold skills and elaborate them as a higher degree of positivity by looking at what are known as the Bodhisattva transcendent virtues, generosity, ethicality or justice, tolerance or patience, creativity, contemplative awareness, and insightful wisdom. Oh, yeah, the tenfold skills, right? But don't kill, don't steal, don't do sexuality abusively, don't lie, don't be divisive, don't be harsh, and don't be meaningless, and don't be malicious, don't be greedy, and don't be unrealistic and fanatical, right? So that's the tenfold one. Then we come to the six transcendent virtues. Generosity is giving things, giving safety, and giving teachings. You should do that's what the three types of giving. You should choose a profession that is generous and philanthropic. A parent, a benefactor helping people get out of poverty and gain wealth through making useful things, such as a farmer, carpenter, architect, miner, or technologist, someone who defends people against violence, such as a soldier or security guard, but a soldier in a defensive sense, like a police person and so on, a doctor of body and, or mind to guard against disease, or a teacher of natural science about the nature of reality, or of social science about the nature of societies, or of human science about human nature in general, psychology, philosophy, literature, music, poetry, theater, and so on, namely the humanities. As, so that's generosity. And it doesn't mean that you have to give everything away, but you have to be willing to. And then the decision to do so or not depends on whether indeed it will be helpful to the person. 
and whether you will have a future ability to give or whether you will then become destitute and need others' generosity only and therefore unable to do anything for them yourself. So, you know, it's, once you have that generosity in principle, then you have to be practical about what you give. As for the second of the six transcendent virtues, justice or ethicality, and here I have to question the whole modern law thing that law schools perversely and pervertedly teach, which is that ethics is not law. So you can be legal while unethical, which is really wrong. But we have we rationalized that in, the, in America, and it's, I mean, our law schools teach that, and it's really very bad. Anyway, as for the second of six transcendent virtues, justice or ethicality, you could be a lawyer, a policeman or policewoman, a social worker, a judge, a writer, an honest politician, or a journalist. So that, that, that way you could be sort of intensify ethics and ethicality goes without saying being ethical yourself in your behavior. That is to say, non-harmful and beneficial to others. As for the third, tolerance and patience, you could be a psychologist, having to tolerate people telling you all their problems, a philosopher, teaching them to see other perspectives of things and therefore tolerate what otherwise they would get outraged about, a creative person, actor, or an artist of any kind which are all teaching higher degrees of observance of experience and therefore being able to tolerate minor injuries and so forth without freaking out, not without being too reactive. As for the fourth, creativity, or sometimes I say creative effort, um, I will give more detail on that in the following chapter on the realistic creativity branch. Because creativity is one of the transcendent virtues of bodhisattvas in the sense of Diligence in, in the positive, and therefore I call it creativity. Not diligence in doing harmful things, but diligence in the positive. That's the fourth, fourth uh, transcendent virtue, and it's the sixth of the eightfold branch. Uh, but although the words are different, this is Vyayama, and that one is Virya. So it's like heroic effort kind of thing. Um, okay. So you could work on the arts or in technologies that apply scientific breakthroughs in an ethical way or be creative in any of the vocations mentioned. The opposite of creativity, of course, is, is uh, paralysis, laziness, sloth, depression. As for the fifth transcendent virtue, contemplative awareness, again, more on this below in the intense concentration chapter which is uh, because that's the eighth one. You know, the seventh and eighth are meditative. Uh, you could possess artistic professions or spirituals. Oh, yeah, yeah, or in any of the main religious or psychological professions. Finally, for the sixth, insightful wisdom, you could be any sort of philosopher or scientist, especially. And this is, again, uh, a drawback of the translation wisdom which we think of as some sort of practical common sense of the old fogey, you know, like um, they're wise, they know when the groundhog is coming out and when spring will come, and blah, blah. Whereas wisdom in prajna in Buddhism is like super intelligence. It's really omniscience and knowing everything very precisely and very deeply from all angles. And so it is to, to develop wisdom means become a scientist, really. Pursuing philosophy and science. Philosophy is, is really the methodology is about the methodology of science, which is why modern materialist science has killed philosophy, actually, in the, in the West, because the people think that, the, that the every sort of theory of practice has been already discovered, and all you do is measure everything and observe it and measure it. And those, it's all matter, and that's been decided. So there's no need for philosophy anymore. Metaphysics is dead. And so philosophy actually is dead. Metaphysics is the main branch of philosophy. It actually means, it doesn't mean something woo-woo. Metaphysics and philosophy means analysis and investigation and inquiry into what is reality. That's what metaphysics means. And that's what science does. But anyway, you can do that deeper and more accurate understanding of the nature of reality. Finally, in this uh, chapter on uh, livelihood, the Dalai Lama's concept, under the heading of Dalai Lama's concept of universal responsibility. In global terms, now this term is, I use it to translate 
Adhyashaya in Sanskrit and Laksam in uh, Tibetan. And what Laksam or Adhyashaya means is actually where someone decides they're going to become a messiah. So it really is a messianic attitude, you know, and that's kind of taboo in the West because of the Christian background of the West, because only Jesus is supposed to be the Messiah. No one else is supposed to do that. You're supposed to accept his help. And he's, a, he's got an omnipotent God behind him in their theology, and therefore he's capable of saving you. And so you don't have to bother to try to save other people. But always Christian mystics or even perceptive uh, Christian thinkers, such as Emerson, Emerson did the cardinal sin at Harvard Divinity School in his youth, or a postgraduate youth, uh, young, young professional level, of saying that really what Christianity was about was everybody had to be Christ, not just expect Christ to save everybody. And, um, and then uh, they never invited him back his entire life, even though he became the most famous teacher in America for the next 45 years. But the Harvard Divinity School would never invite him back because that was heresy to question the omnipotence of God operating through his only son, his only agent to go out and help and save people, you know. And therefore to say that everybody had to be Christ was, some, was a kind of heresy. So they felt they, did, they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't hire him for a lecture or even invite him for a lecture. Unbelievable. But such is how high. However, in the Buddhist Mahayana sense, in, in order to become a Buddha, you have to become a Bodhisattva. In order to become a Bodhisattva, you have to decide you are going to be responsible for every other being, and you are going to try to help them free themselves from every kind of suffering. And that includes all non-human beings, even demons, even enemies, even evil beings. You are going to be their savior, uh, because that's what a Buddha is defined as being capable of doing. Even though, in another kind of amusing contradiction, the Buddha seems to want help. <laughs> because he says, I want, other I want you to become Buddha too. So, so because B B Buddha disclaims omnipotence. He doesn't disclaim omniscience, omniscience, that you can do. You can know everything. But you can't force other, the, and the reason you don't have omnipotence is, you can't force other people to solve their problems by becoming Buddhas themselves. You can only encourage them to do so, coach them on how to do so, encourage them by the possibility that it is possible to do so by doing so yourself, and then coach them how they could do it. That's the only thing you can do. You can't force them to be happy. It's like if you run after a paranoiac and say, I'm going to give you such a great hug that you're going to be really happy, that paranoiac will consider you're out to smack them down and they'll fight you off. And you will not be able to do it. Anybody knows that. That's practical. You cannot force a paranoiac not to fear you by smothering them in affection. It will not work. You have to lure them in some other way to try to, like, tr actually, they say the future Buddha Maitreya is manifesting himself as pets especially dogs, to get paranoid human beings to realize that there's one other kind of being that when they look at them, they wag their tail and they want to be stroked on the back of their neck or their head and pet them. And it's actually a, a small version of a wolf that would want to eat that human being. So, so the future Buddha manifests as dogs to encourage people that they can trust at least one other person. Their pet, you know, their dog. Really quite a nice idea. So in global terms, Dalai Lama is the most important of all world leaders, and he often wins global popularity contests. When I was observing that, or maybe when they were doing it more, maybe they don't do it anymore, I don't know, because dictatorships don't allow such a free polling. But in the, in the previous decades, I remember the Dalai Lama up there with Pope John Paul. Benedict never got anywhere up in the global popularity, but John Paul did because of his overcoming communism. Maybe because he was Polish, I don't know, also. 
And uh, also, Brangelina often won worldwide popularity contests when they were a couple with all their many children and so on. And the Dalai Lama was always up there in the top three or four. Sometimes he was the absolute leader, sometimes he was in the top three or four. And that was worldwide, not just the West. You know, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, wherever, Africa, um, South Africa, the Dalai Lama always would win out. Because somehow everybody kind of had this inkling that there's a guy who cares about everybody and he, he's not into whatever, whoever's oppressing me. Everybody sort of had that little bit of insight about him. So anyway, he's a man without a country. He's what they call in Zen, the true man of no rank. His value can be measured by his urging that his leadership is not important, that he's a simple monk and mendicant there to serve others, and that all he can say to us is that we must exert our own leadership, and that we must all assume what he calls universal responsibility for our own fate and the fate of the earth. And so, but you know, then I asked him, I said, oh, your holiness, how come you're so much into this universal responsibility? I said, wonderful, I said, that's the greatest way of translating klaksam, I said to him. He said, I didn't lose that to translate klaksam, he said. I said, well, where did you get it from? Well, I said, then he was, I didn't take it from a Tibetan term, he said. In other words, he just thought it out in English, but actually it is klaksam. And why do I say that? Because in the ten, in the, in the sevenfold path, to become a bodhisattva in one of the systems of doing so, you do treat, you think of all beings as your mother in previous lives, so therefore you owe them kind of maternal affection, you know, like, like, like an infant's affection to a mother. Then you feel um, gratitude to them, you got to cultivate gratitude to all beings, for having been your mother and having the potential of being so again in an infinite future. And then you develop a wish to repay that kindness. So those first three things based on the child's feeling for the mother. And then you have loved them and you think of them as beautiful and having a possibility of being happy, that's love, wishing them to be happy. Then you feel compassion for them when you think that they are not necessarily happy, but you want to take away their suffering, then the sixth thing that you do is you think to yourself, well, there's all these Buddhas and deities around who are supposed to be very powerful, much more than me, but they somehow haven't made all my mothers happy because I see a lot of suffering here. So I'm going to fit in and I'm going to make beings happy where they, met, they failed. And so that's where, that's the, you know, that's Laksam, Adyashaya, where you have an excessive aspiration to free everyone, not just yourself, from suffering. And that, and then that leads to the Bodhisattva thing, but, but although the seventh step then is, well, how can I do that? And then you say, well, only a Buddha can do that, so I'll have to become a Buddha for their sake. And then, then you become a Bodhisattva. So that universal responsibility is that sixth stage where you say, I'll be a messiah, since Buddha is considered a kind of savior and messiah. Nobody translated it all that way prior to me. Like they often say, Buddha, my protector, my refuge. So that's pretty good. Someone protects you as a refuge, but also a local policeman protects you. Whereas the Nata expression, Nata, Tara's name, Tara, who is savior, it means. They save you, they don't just protect you, they protect you from bad rebirths, from miserable suffering of being reborn in negative forms of life. They really save you, actually. But they didn't use that, translators, because that was a holy word, and save for Christianity, you see. And they're subliminal, even they were atheists. And Buddhist translators, they were so scared of those words that they feel are owned by the church. That's what has happened for the last 120 years until a heathen pagan like me came along and realized the one cardinal thing that Christian theologians really hate, and they'll burn you at the stake for it, if you say somebody else is doing the same job as you. And so you should seek their alliance with them rather than seek to convert them to your way of doing it. Because they're doing the same job. That's the cardinal sin. You know, I, I was on the tenure committee of someone at a Catholic university who was a friend of mine and a student of my original guru. 
And she spent her whole academic career up to what's called tenure, where you get a long-term job instead of every couple of years contract, trying to prove how Buddhism was okay because it was doing the same thing as Christianity. And I, when I had to evaluate her portfolio, I said, listen, please write an article that only Christianity does this way and that way. Please write two or three articles like that so I can refer to them. And she didn't. And therefore, they busted her, although she was an incredibly popular teacher, had a lot of publications, and there was no right to do it. But that was the cardinal sin, to say that there's, there are more Jesuses than are in, known in your vocabulary, you know, to say that, like, and that God has more agents. The, the power of goodness has more actors and more agency than just this one Jewish guy, this one Jewish rabbi who was trying to preach there and was, had his sermonizing cut off by the Romans. How can that be the only effort of an omnipotent God? Come on, give us a break. But they, they won't listen because they're, they're indoctrinated that without him, you're going to hell. You know? That's their, they're, they're so terrified. And this is subliminal that anybody brought up in those, in those churches. But the universal responsibility, although His Holiness didn't want to think it was connected to messianism, but the accurate, an accurate thing that is a messianic attitude, meaning you're going to save everybody for our own fate and the fate of the earth. And that gives it, that's why Bodhisattva, and Bodhisattva practice. And also even in Buddhism, Mahayana was not really well known because the early writers of Buddhism were working from Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka, after Buddhism was wiped out in India by Islamic presence, Islamic domination basically is what wiped it out. And uh, once that happened, then the Sri Lanka people became very orthodox, non-Mahayana. So they didn't know about Mahayana, and they thought that was something they invented in China. But actually, Buddha originally taught Mahayana, and Mahayana, and, and, it, and it became popular in India around the same time as Jesus was teaching in West Asia and through the Persian Empire. Okay, anyway, he teaches several key concepts. The Dalai Lama does, I think I'm teaching here. I'm talking about his universal responsibility. First, he stresses the importance and power of science. And of course, that's contrary to Western idea of religion, which has to be anti-science, because religion is supposed to be blind faith, meaning irrational faith. So you're supposed to believe something that you don't actually believe, that you're forced into that position by the way that religion and science are categorized in our culture, <clears throat> by science having to rebel against the Inquisition. And, uh, and in that history, we're kept in a crippled mental state. I've dealt with students for many years who are taught from youth, that they can't really understand anything. They can, therefore, they have to be obedient to authority. That is the nature of the European and American cultures. I'm sorry, that is it. That's why they get Hitlers, and they get uh, you know, unpleasant kings, and they get bad presidents, actually, and bad corporate leaders, because they're indoctrinated to be obedient. Even the word in English, to understand, when you have an aha, you're standing under something. What are you standing under? When you stand under something is when you're obeying someone. That is to say, you say, oh, aha means yes, I, I'll do whatever you tell me, whether it makes sense to me or not. But that's not what, in Sanskrit, or in, a, in one of the Buddhist languages, to really have an insight into something is to adhigama. It means to go more intense, to go over something to enter a new reality, because you see you suddenly reality reveals itself to you as something completely different, and you, which somebody else who might be bossing you around doesn't know, I and mean, you know. So it's a challenge, actually, to obedience, you know. And for example, Buddhist mendicancy, monasticism, obedience is not a major virtue at all. There's no business of I have to obey the abbot in Buddhist monastics, not at all. That is the cardinal virtue in Western Christian monasticism is obedience to the abbot. Because the abbot is obedient to the royal authority that allows there to be a monastery in militarized, violent Europe. And then, they, then everybody has to be obedient to the king, and then the king is obedient to God. So it's one big hierarchy of obedience and authoritarianism in the cultural mind of the people. And it's crippling, actually. It's crippling to people. 
and, uh, and therefore faith should be reasonable. We, are, we give something credibility and we believe in it even if we're not certain if it's reasonable as far as we know, not if it's contrary to reason. That's my point. Okay? So first he stresses the importance and power of science. Now I'm talking about Dalai Lama. That we must come to know reality for ourselves through the sciences, not settling only for experts' opinions, but trying to learn something and think for ourselves. Be your own common sense scientist. Don't just say to the doctor, yes, I'll take this drug or that if you tell me. Why do I take this drug? Why should I eat that thing and not eat this thing? In other words, you have to find that out and understand it yourself, and you can. You can recognize and realize and know it yourself. Second, he urges us to practice the common human religion of kindness, the religious and secular spirituality of caring for others as kindly and gently as possible, because this is simply an evolutionary imperative for beings who are social animals. They have to care for one another to some extent, at least. Otherwise, you cannot have society. You cannot even have a family. They won't be together. They will fight each other and be destructive. So that's, it's not a religious thing. In other words, it's constantly saying compassion. It's a practical thing. Third, he encourages us to take up the sense of universal responsibility. That's the highest one. That we must decide that we are responsible for everything. That's like the person who's going down the street and there's a piece of garbage that missed the garbage can and fell in the gutter and if they can easily pick it up and put it in the garbage can even though they didn't drop it and they don't have to but you know it's a pain there and it will be crushed by someone and it will pollute things and they can easily do it and they just feel happy to do it. That's universal responsibility and, th and, and that's any, no society can work well without everyone feeling that way. Especially a democracy has to be like that. That we must decide that we are responsible for everything and that this will not exhaust us or give us compassion fatigue, quote unquote, or responsibility burnout, but will keep us toned and active and ready to take on whatever we see needs doing. And it gives us more energy, actually. Part of it is precisely not to use the excuse of being overwhelmed and therefore retreat into being irresponsible. Given a sense of universal responsibility for everything, we can then take up each little thing we see in front of us, and so take it all on in baby steps, bit by bit, moment after moment. It sounds huge, but it's really a matter of not leaving a piece of gar oh, I'm saying that. <laughs> I keep repeating myself. piece of garbage on the sidewalk next to a garbage can for someone else to deal with. Instead, that drives me crazy in a household. I really don't like living with people who put their dishes in the sink and wait for the angel to come and wash them. I really don't like that. And I mean, I kind of do it when I'm the angel because then I get to wash it and I enjoy washing dishes. It's one of my favorite occupations. However, it's very wrong of the mind of the person who does it. And it means it makes them unhappy and unsatisfied, actually. But it's really a matter of not, yeah, yeah. Instead, we just simply stop, bend down, pick it up carefully, and toss it in ourselves. If we can adopt what I call the infinite lifestyle, that's in my book, Infinite Life. It's opposed to the terminal lifestyle of the materialist. We have endless time ahead of us, and we can perfect the universe, turn it into a Buddhaverse bit by bit. That's when you perfect the universe, we call it a Buddhaverse. That is why these three tenets are excellent methods to keep in mind when cultivating and maintaining a realistic livelihood that will benefit not only ourselves, but all of those around us. So those are one, wisdom is the key, science, knowing how to do things and what the consequences of things are and understanding causation. Second, kindness as a common practical thing. And third, stepping up to universal responsibility. So that's it. That's it for today. I think I've done a lot today. I think that's really important. It's covered a few pages. We went to 104 to 108. And uh, 108 is a good place to stop. So now, So may we quickly do that. 
And we, may we dedicate that to become enlightened ourselves as soon as possible, to join all the other Buddhas in helping everybody else become enlightened and quite equal to us. That's a key. Okay, that's our dedication of the merit of this class.